Well, thank you very much for that introduction and for the hospitality. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here. So I'm just going to start off by supposing that if I were to ask you what the value of the Canadian dollar was today, or even yesterday, I bet you'd assume that I was talking about the Canadian dollar relative to the US dollar. And you'd probably get the value bang on. It's pretty understandable that that would be the case because the United States is our biggest trading partner. And most Canadians, and really especially people like you in this room, know very well the economic and financial links that we have with that country. Now, if I were to ask you what the value of the Canadian dollar was relative to the Chinese renminbi, probably the answers wouldn't be as accurate. And this makes sense too, because even though you might be reading a lot in the newspaper about how China's growth is slowing and how there's financial volatility there, it's really not a number that you come across very often. Yet China's Canada's second largest trading partner, and it accounts for 17% of the world economy. There's more than 400 companies that have a foothold there, and these companies are in sectors as diverse as life sciences, aerospace, information technology. China's currency, the renminbi, is on its way to becoming a global reserve currency. I'm thinking that a decade from now, our children may be able to convert Canadian dollars into renminbi as easily as we do now with the US dollar. We pay really close attention to China at the Bank of Canada because of its growing importance to Canada's economic and financial well-being. And today what I want to do is share with you some of what we've learned by studying China's economy and its evolution. I also want to discuss some of the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. I think this is relevant to all regions of Canada, but especially here in Vancouver. It's a real pleasure to be here. I don't know whether you looked, but I did this morning. It's minus seven in Ottawa. And I heard some rumblings about the weather, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you have cherry blossoms. So, but I'd especially like to thank the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade for the invitation. Thank you. So, what I'm going to do in my remarks is walk you through four points that frame our thinking about China. The first one is, is that China's rise to the world stage has been exceptional exceptional, even disruptive, and beneficial for the global economy in Canada. The second point is that the slowing in China's growth to a more sustainable pace is not only inevitable, it's desirable. Third is that history teaches us that this type of transition is difficult to manage. It takes time and it's very likely to be uneven. And my final point is that Canada is not immune to the risks that China poses to the global economy, but we are well positioned to manage them. So I'm going to give my remarks in English, but I want to repeat these key points in French for the benefit of the people who are looking at the, the webcast. Dans mon discours, je passerai en revue quatre points qui orientent nos réflexions sur la Chine. La montée en puissance de la Chine en, sur la scène internationale a été remarquable et même déstabilisatrice. Toutefois, elle a été profitable pour l'économie mondiale et le Canada. Le, le ralentissement de la croissance de l'économie chinoise pour revenir à un rythme plus soutenable est non seulement inévitable, la transition est difficile à gérer, demande du temps, et risque d'entraîner de la volatilité économique et financière. Et finalement, le Canada n'est pas à l'abri des risques que la Chine fait peser sur l'économie mondiale, mais nous sommes en mesure d'y faire face. So, I'll start with my first point. And that's really about China's market reforms of the 1980s and its ascension to the World Trade Organization in 2001, 
which marked the beginning of a remarkable transformation that was felt around the world. And for, for China, this process has been overwhelmingly positive, even though it has entailed some stresses, and particularly environmental ones. The facts speak for themselves. The economy has more than tripled in size. More than a quarter of a billion Chinese people have been lifted out of poverty in what has been the largest migration of workers to cities in history. Life expectancy has increased by nearly three years. And China is hosting the G20 this year, which is just one example of its growing presence on the world stage. Now, China's transformation has also yielded benefits for the global economy. It's true that China and other emerging markets have presented stiff competition to exporters around the globe, including in Canada. And we see the result of this competition in the declining percentage of people working in manufacturing industries in advanced economies. And this has been difficult for many. And China likely contributed to the buildup of imbalances in the global financial system ahead of the crisis in 2008. Yet China's expansion has also helped drive global trade to record highs. And this means that exporters around the world have been selling into a bigger market. At the same time, businesses and households have benefited from lower prices of many goods. China's growth has also meant better prices for the resources that Canada sells. China became the world's second largest consumer of oil after its demand doubled over the past 15 years, and it now buys half the world's output of base metals, compared to less than 20% in 2001. And this, all told, has helped make Canada richer. One way to look at that is just to see how China's in increased demand for commodities has contributed to the big improvement in Canada's terms of trade between 2001 and 2008. It increased by like 23% or something. And the terms of trade, just as a reminder, is just the price of our exports relative to the price of our imports. Now, the terms of trade have fallen over the past couple of years, as you all well know, in part because of the slowing growth in China but it still remains over 10% higher than it was when China joined the World Trade Organization. But it's hard to overstate just how quickly economic links between our two countries have developed. Trade between Canada and China increased more than five-fold over the past decade and a half, and British Columbia has seized this opportunity. There's just one fact I found particularly interesting, and it's that China bought just under one-third of the province's exports of forestry products last year, and that's compared with just 4% in 2001. And businesses here are working on other opportunities, like LNG. So our governments have also worked to encourage trade and investment through, tra through accords and trade missions and other agreements with China. And the foreign direct investment in both directions really speaks to the deep links that have been formed. So it's time to turn to my second point, which is, while well, China's economic growth has had an overall positive impact on the Canadian economy, that growth is slowing now. And it's slowing to what I'm gonna call a more sustainable pace. And it's inevitable and it's desirable. The Chinese economy expanded a little less than 7% last year, and that just sounds really fast relative to advanced economies. But it's the slowest pace for China in 25 years. The slowdown is natural, and that's because the economic strategy that the Chinese have pursued over the last 15 years just can't continue indefinitely. The strategy they've been pursuing is simple. It's you add more workers and you add more capital to increase the economy's potential to produce goods, and then you sell those goods on global markets. 
And this strategy has run its course for a couple of reasons. And the first one is that demographic forces are no longer in China's favor. The working age population, which is pretty important to an economy's potential, is projected to shrink by about 5% by 2030. And the second reason is that China's reliance on investment is just not sustainable. Right now, investment in China is about 45% of GDP. And just to give you an idea how high that is, in, in other emerging market economies, it's about 25. And for advanced economies, it's about 20%. And this strong investment policy is increasingly creating redundant or, unproduct or unproductive capital in China. And while the investment may create growth in the short run, what it does is it increases the odds of a painful economic adjustment in the future. But I think for all of us here, what's on our minds are, well, where is growth is slowing in China, but where is this growth going to settle out if the transition that they're trying to make is successful? Well, we just published some research today at the Bank of Canada, so a little plug to look on our website. And what this research shows is that China has the potential to grow at an annual rate of around 6% on average over the next 15 years. And that's a pretty decent pace. At that pace, it takes less than 12 years for the economy to double in size. And to understand just how could this kind of growth be possible, we need to remember that China's GDP per capita is still only one-fifth of what it is in the U.S. And this means that China still has a lot of room to catch up. And they can do this by adopting existing technologies that already exist, or increasing education levels, and continuing the process of urbanization. An important implication for Canada of all this is that China's demand for commodities should remain high and grow from a much higher base. So that's, that's my second point. My third point is that history shows that the transition to the next stage of development is difficult to manage. It takes time and it's quite likely to be uneven. And if China is going to achieve its potential to grow, it's going to have to avoid what economists call the middle income trap. And this is when a developing country that seems destined to join the advanced economy club just sees its growth stagnate for years. Now, Chinese authorities do recognize that their challenge right now is to shift from an economy that's fueled by investment to one that's supported by domestic consumption. And another challenge they have is to boost productivity. To meet these challenges and to achieve the economy's potential, the Chinese authorities are working on it to fit a number of pieces together. And it's kind of like a Chinese puzzle. There's lots of pieces that they need to fit together, but I'm going to mention three of them. The first one is really outside of the purview of central banking, but it is crucial to achieving the rotation of demand to consumption. And that's, and that's a social safety net. So in advanced economies, they have a public pension system, they have unemployment insurance, they have health care. And because of that, risks are pooled. And so people have relatively less need to save for a rainy day, and so they can spend more out of their income. And that's why people in developed economies save about five cents out of every dollar they earn. If you contrast this with China, Urban households currently save nearly 40 cents out of every dollar they earn. So another thing they're going to have to do is have workers and capital adjust as the economy shifts out of state-owned sectors like coal and steel and move towards more high-value-added service sectors. And this is, this is a lengthy transition that perhaps we know well because many people will need to relocate. It's a big country. And some people will need to be retrained. Now, China has made raising the level of social protection a priority in its new five-year plan. 
The second piece is very relevant to central bankers. It's a solid monetary framework. And of course, you're going to expect that I think this is important because it's the foundation to sustainable growth. And what China faces right now in terms of their monetary framework is, is this classic policy trilemma. And what that is is the fact that they can't simultaneously, simultaneously maintain a fixed exchange rate, independent monetary policy, and free capital flows. At least they can't sustain that on, uh, for very long. It's just the classic case of you can't have it all. And resolving this trilemma isn't going to be easy, and it will also take time. And just to take you a little bit back, no one knows this more than, than Canada. Uh, we confronted the trilemma and then later adopted inflation targeting in 1991, which turned out, in retrospect, to be the perfect co complement to a floating exchange rate and free capital flows. But we need to remember that it took Canada several decades and a number of policy reversals and missteps to reach this point. I don't know if there are any history buffs in the room, but if you are, you're going to remember that when Canada finally adopted a floating exchange rate for good in 1970, we still lacked a robust monetary anchor. And this contributed to a period of very high inflation that lasted through the early 1980s. And the lesson for us is that orienting monetary policy towards achieving low and stable inflation can lead to better economic outcomes. China just only recently moved from pegging the renminbi to the U.S. dollar to maintaining stability against a basket of currencies. They've now got 13 currencies in the basket. And targeting a basket will allow for some exchange rate movement, at least more exchange rate movement within the basket than they had before, which in turn could facilitate some deep structural adjustments. Certainly in Canada, we've seen that our floating exchange rate supports adjustments that are structural in nature, like the reorientation to the non-resource sector that we're going through now. And my, my colleague, Lynn Patterson, gave a really great speech last week about this. So if you're interested in learning more about the transition, I recommend you uh, read that speech. So that sounds good, but there's always a but. <laughs> Targeting a, a basket of currencies leads to speculative flows if the target value is not adjusted on a timely basis. And Chinese authorities have committed to further loosening restrictions on international flows. And if they manage it well and they time it right, this could help China's transition. Yet liberalizing the capital account is one of the most difficult challenges that a de developing country can face. And just recall the Asian crisis as an example. The countries liberal liberalized their capital accounts before their financial systems were ready. And they suffered a currency crisis in 1997 that set their development back a few years. And a lesson from this is really the need to have developed and resilient financial markets when you do this so that you can accommodate large financial flows and that you can price risk properly. So the last piece I'm going to talk about is, is financial stability. And there are some points of concern here with China and financial stability. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, China embarked on a massive expansion of credit to support domestic demand. And so China's overall debt has grown much faster than its economy since then, and now is about 285 percent of GDP. Around 60 percent of that is in the non-financial corporate sector, mainly state-owned enterprises. And this is a sector where a lot of excess capital and non-performing loans may, may reside. And there are other worries too, like potential unreporting of non-reporting, non-performing loans in the banking sector, and the strong growth in lending by non-bank entities that might be lightly regulated. So that being said, China is a, a net international creditor. To got about uh, 1.7 trillion U.S. dollars, and. This insulates China to some extent from decisions of international investors. 
The People's Bank of China has so far been able to manage downward pressures on the renminbi that have come with capital outflows. If you're following the numbers, you'll know that about 600 billion is estimated, US dollars is estimated to have left China last year. And some of this is maybe good flows because it was going to corporations paying down their debt. And the People's Bank of China still has around 3 trillion US dollars in foreign reserves. Nonetheless, you're seeing some volatility and there is a concern in markets that if capital account pressures continue, at some point the central bank may have to either lower its target range for the currency or introduce more stringent capital controls. The Chinese authorities are focusing right now on more proactive communications and reforms to foster trust in their financial system. Now this brings me to my final point which is Canada is not immune to the risk that China's transition poses to the global economy, but it's nonetheless well positioned to, to manage them. At the Bank of Canada, we've been thinking through what a shock from China would mean for our economy if, if, uh, if there was something that went wrong there, and we've talked about this in our publications. Now, Canada would be mainly affected through two channels, the commodity price channel and the trade channel. The direct financial spillovers would likely be relatively small because our banks have little direct exposure to China. And if you look at the US and European banks that our banks do business with, well, they have strengthened their balance sheets quite a lot since the financial crisis. That said, there is some uncertainty about China's prospects and we've certainly seen some surprisingly large effects on investor confidence in recent months and so this could be an important channel. To get a rough idea of how important the trade and commodity price channels are, or could be, our staff conducted simulations using our economic models. And they looked at what the effect would be on the Canadian economy if GDP growth in China were one percentage point lower than our baseline projection. And our baseline projection shows that there's growth. And what they found is that Canadian GDP would be about 0.1 percentage points lower than it would have been otherwise. And just to give you, like, well, what's that number really mean? Well, to give it some perspective, if we calculated the effect of the same shock to the US, the effect on Canadian GDP would be six times greater. So that's what our model says about the, the commodity price channels and the trade channels. Now, of course, the effects on, of a shock from China would also depend on a number of factors that our models don't capture very well, like what parts of the Chinese economy were affected or growing more slowly or how severely uh, global financial markets were impaired. A significant depreciation in the renminbi, especially if it were sudden, would certainly be disruptive to the global financial system, and this would likely have implications for Canada. It would also depend on when the shock hit and where Canada was in its progress, uh, in its own adjustment to the drop in commodity prices that we've seen in the past three, two years. Starting points matter. And finally, on this point, I'll just mention, and it's, it's really worth mentioning, that Canadian financial institutions have the capital and the liquidity in place to handle these kinds of adverse shocks. So, Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to conclude, and I'd like to conclude with a quote that dates back two centuries and attributed to Napoleon. So, Napoleon is reported to have said about China, here lies a sleeping giant. Let him sleep, for when he wakes up, he will shake up the world. Well, this was prescient, to say the least. China's integration into the world economy has been nothing short of extraordinary. And China's economy continues to mature. Its growth is slowing to a more sustainable pace. And this is desirable. China has the potential to grow at a healthy pace over the longer run. 
The transition will take time, and there is uncertainty about whether this potential will be fully achieved. That means that China may, be go, go, may go through periods of economic and financial volatility. At the Bank of Canada, we will continue to watch developments in China closely, given its importance to Canada. Compte tenu de son importance, la Banque du Canada continuera à surveiller de près les évolutions en Chine. China's transition poses risks, and Canada is well positioned to manage them. At the same time, lower prices for oil and other commodities mean that Canada is going through its own complex adjustment. In March, we left the policy interest rate unchanged since the economy was evolving broadly in line with our expectations that we set out in January. Next week, we'll update our projection and take into account all that's happened in January, since January, and of course, we'll include the measures that were announced in the federal budget. And if you're still wondering about the exchange rate and have resisted Googling it, the answer is five renminbi per Canadian dollar. Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for that very insightful view and a little bit of history of how the Chinese economy has grown so significantly and is a, a power to be reckoned with. And uh, as you commented in your remarks, that uh, Canada, the financial system in Canada, is well positioned um, to withstand some of the volatility that will uh, have an impact coming out of China as they move from their growth to their transition and stability. Uh, I think you said 15 years they could uh, grow at 6%. Wouldn't we love to have 6% growth in the next 15 years? So now is the time when we uh, ask the audience for your participation. And uh, we do have uh, uh, about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So please write down some questions because um, I'm sure that we would be... Uh, I don't have all of the questions up here, but I do have a couple. Okay. So let me kick off. Um, and this one is really, I'm looking for a comment from you. Um, as we've been reading in the paper um, on an ongoing basis, um, and the paper usually tends to be on the dark side, there is slowing uh, economic growth, and the prediction is, is that it seems to be slowing even more. And on the IMF webpage just recently, it was posted, I think it was actually posted in the last day and a half, it was a quote from the managing director, Christine Lagarde, in a speech that she gave at Gotham University in Frankfurt, and I quote, if policymakers can confront the challenges and act together, global confidence and the global economy will get a substantial boost. A substantial boost, excuse me. So, what might this mean for Canada? Well, certainly there is some uncertainty out there about the momentum that's in global growth, and of course, you read about that that every day. Uh, and at the international level, uh, there is, you know, a great understanding of the importance of making, uh, I guess, judicious policy choices, whether they're fiscal policy choices or structural policy choices or monetary policy choices uh, to, uh, to support demand uh, given domestic objectives. And so, and so what this means for, for, for Canada, at least from a monetary policy point of view, which I can speak to, is that we will continue to focus on our main mandate in monetary policy, which is to achieve our inflation target uh, and, and uh, be a good citizen about it in the sense that we'll focus on achieving domestic objectives and also being as clear as possible in our communications. I think one of the things that, that has been widely discussed internationally is just the importance of those communications, especially for uh, the, the bigger economies like the US, like Europe, like China, in terms of uh, letting market participants understand what central banks are trying to achieve and what kinds of actions they might be considering to achieve those objectives. So there's a lot, obviously, the focus of our conversation today is on China. 
um, and there's obviously uh, tremendous opportunities for us. But one nation that seems to be left out of the conversation a lot these days is India. Mm -hmm. And it is set to become one of, the world, one of the world's most populous countries. And in the next few years, um, you know, has such a rapidly growing and educated middle class. Uh, where do you see us in Canada from an Indo-Canadian perspective tapping into that relationship and the growth that's anticipated to come with India? Well, I, I expect that the relationship with India will continue to grow slowly over time. It certainly has grown over the past, uh, over the past uh, decade, of course from very low levels. If I've got my facts straight, the, uh, India is our sixth largest trading partner, but as a percentage of GDP or percentage of exports, it's a very small amount. Uh, so so uh, it's absolutely right that India is one of those emerging markets that is growing very quickly. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has indicated that they're very interested in infra infrastructure, building infrastructure there, which means that the demand for commodities, different kinds of commodities, is going to be quite strong. And so certainly, certainly uh, Canada is well positioned to take advantage of that. It's outside the Bank of Canada's mandate to really think about how to do that practically, but certainly the bank is, has always uh, been uh, quite keen to see diversi diversification in the economy, diversification in ex export de destinations, and any kind of initiatives that lead to that uh, would, be, would be welcome. So we have some questions from the audience. The first one I have here is financial reforms for not-for-profit organizations or non-banking. As China, as China continues to advance financial and regulatory reforms, are there any concrete steps that the Bank of Canada and or regulators can take or cooperate with China on them to help them? And this comes from Jamie Mitchell at Advantage BC. Well, in fact, uh, Canada is very active in international organizations, whether with the bank associated with the Bank for International Settlements, the Basel Committee on um, Banking Supervision, or the Financial Stability Board. I happen to sit on the Financial Stability Board. And what those international organizations do is work with the G20 countries, or the countries that are members, to think about ways to safeguard the financial system, not only internationally, but domestically in their own jurisdictions. And China is part of that process. In fact, um, because Canada starts with C, and so does China, I actually sit right beside the pleasure of sitting right beside the Chinese representatives. And so, and so in the particular areas that were mentioned, I think the popular term for some of this non-bank financial activity is shadow banking. Uh, there's been, there have been a number of uh, initiatives primarily focused on getting the right data to, to uh, be able to measure and assess the risks in the sector, and then taking uh, where appropriate uh, regulatory actions to safeguard the system to the extent that that sector is undertaking risks that are light, too lightly regulated, put it that way. And so I think what Canada is doing is really sharing experiences with other countries, including China. Uh, we're benefiting from, from their experience as well. And, and, uh, and I think that whole process in international financial reform is is helping shore up the financial system and learning some of the lessons from the financial crisis. So on the theme of financial strength in the Canadian banks, the Bank of Canada believe that the Canadian banks and financial institutions are well placed to weather financial shocks. Why did the government include bank bailout language in the recent budget? Sure. Uh, well, the basis of my statement with respect to the banks being able to weather a shock is, is based on stress tests that, that we undertake with OSFI, uh, the Office of the Superintendent for Financial Institutions, uh, that look at banks under different scenarios that sound really bad, like something as bad as the 2008 crisis or some of the deepest recessions that we had. And one of these stress tests, if you're interested, was done actually by the International Monetary Fund and published. We have something else that was published in 2014. So, so um, that's a way to test it. Kind of hit them with a stress test and you see, well, how do they perform if under that stress test? And so, uh, and so that's what underpinned 
underpin that statement. With respect to the, the uh, federal government's announcement with respect to bail-in, you know, one of the, in, the international initiatives was to help resolve the problem of too big to fail. Okay? And that's just a question of when, you know, when you're an investor and things go well, you, you win, <laughs> but when things go poorly, you don't really lose, it's the taxpayer that loses, right? And so that asymmetry in risk and reward is something that, that, uh, that many countries in the G20 uh, have, uh, have agreed to do. Bail-in is part of that process. There are a number of other things that were done as part of that process, but why bail-in is part of that process is what it does is it says that creditors, so senior under unsecured creditors, are on the hook. They can be bailed in, converted into equity, or, or just written down, uh, and that's going to occur before the taxpayer has to pay anything. And hopefully there's enough bail-in debt that's there to avoid the possibility that the taxpayer would ever need to be tapped for that. And so that's, that's the reason. Now, of course, the reason that, that, uh, that governments have decided this is part of the FSB process, the G20 process has decided this is a good idea, isn't necessarily because they think that it's likely that a financial institution will fail. It's part of the the, uh, plan, the the prudent planning process, just in case that really bad event happens, and it's also part of the process of when you, when you're an investor and you invest, you can price that risk properly, as opposed to think, well, I don't need to because someone else is going to bail me out. So shifting to another topic, as emerging markets mature. Do you foresee Canada's trade relationship with them shifting from a commodity and manufacturing one to one based more on capital investment and finance? That's an interesting question. Well, I think that when you look at some of the, if you look into the details, uh, the short answer is yes, it may be slow and take time, but I think, I think the answer is we'll see more uh, we'll see more exports of financial services and other high-end services. What you are seeing now uh, in some jurisdictions is growth in that area and certainly Canadian financial institutions are, have, a very, have an excellent reputation and a lot of expertise in that area. Uh, and there could be other services that, that uh, are exportable as well. So, Carolyn, I think we're out of time, but we have one last question, so okay. just bear with us here. Um, how will TPP change the economic relationship between Canada and high-growth countries such as Malaysia and Vietnam? Well, the, the, the goal of the TPP is to open doors, and so, and so the relationship should be, should be strengthened. It's not the Bank of Canada's role to, to negotiate or or validate any of these deals, uh, and it is it is the government's role, uh, and it is early days. But certainly, uh, as I said as I said earlier, the idea of diversification, the idea uh, in in uh, potential markets, the idea of removing barriers and establishing links uh, with other jurisdictions that are likely to grow grow a lot faster than than Western countries is an opportunity and certainly one that, that we welcome. So on behalf of all of the audience that are here today, Carolyn, thank you very much for That's taking time out of your very busy schedule to be here and share your insights on to, uh, as to the chi where the Chinese economy has come from and how they've been able to succeed and as they transition into a different economy uh, where the stability will be and how we'll be able to benefit from that and from the Q&A time. Please join me in thanking Carolyn Wilkins.